The Macabre World Podcast is brought to you by Darker Art Studio, home of real human bone jewelry. Stock and custom pieces are available, so visit us on the web at www.darkerartstudio.com and show them your darker art side. Macabre World, a podcast from Darker Art Studio where we explore the dark, strange, and unusual from this world and beyond. Hello and welcome to the Macabre World Podcast. I'm your host, Rocky Degatti. And with me today is Joshua Chairs, who is the director and founder of Phantom Detectives. And you can find them at phantomdetectives.org. We'll have some more information on you uh, later in the program. But Joshua, welcome and thanks for joining us. Thank you for letting me join. It's a pleasure to have you today. I'm forward to uh, answering any questions that come in from your end and your listeners end. Well, you know, we always say let's start at the very good be- beginning because it's a very good place to start, like the song says. So where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the paranormal? Did it start early? Tell us about it. Absolutely. I actually was born in Philadelphia, uh, right outside in Chester in 1984. And, you know, uh, much, much like every kid uh, during those days, I originally got my start uh, watching Unsolved Mysteries with Robert Stack, much like any kid in those days. And what really started piquing my interest in the paranormal was there was an episode called The Haunting of the General Wayne Inn in Marion Station, Pennsylvania. And the General Wayne Inn dates back to 1804. It's called The Inn of the Seventeen Ghosts. And many people have reported seeing a lot of apparitions such as Hessian soldiers in the various rooms. Also, people have reported seeing, uh, you know, a car that would start on its own. And a lot of the ladies that would be in the bar area would be touched uh, in, in, uh, by unseen forces. And supposedly there's a report now watch after watching that episode that the patrons would be in the bar and they supposedly there would be everything with the, the, the clock, the TV would turn counterclockwise and then clockwise. And that has never happened at any point in the history of the general way in so i actually had the uh after I started researching that history in the early 90s i started you know, um, really getting pulled into ufology as well as ghosts and i started what really piqued my interest was watching this nbc program called the other side with um linda moulton hell she was an emmy award-winning uh reporter she's an, a world-renowned expert on crop circles cattle mutilations and all that so i really started peeking and i started listening to her on a, a show called Dreamland with the late uh, late night talk show host Art Bell, who uh, basically was early, you know, everyone that listened to him in those days. And he, of course, Linda actually used to do a lot of the reports uh, for Art, uh, co-hosting Dreamland with him from Huntington Valley, Pennsylvania. So um, after listening to Art, I really started getting captivated by the, the subjects. And then in 2002, my early mentor, Michael Lee Mayer, she's since passed away, uh, we did a local paranormal investigation at the General Wayne Inn. Uh, we actually went back there and actually did our own private investigation. And there I went and, you know, back in those days, there wasn't a lot of sophisticated paranormal investigation equipment. You might have had like maybe an EMF meter, a voice recorder, a flashlight and, you know, some basic uh, things. So basically down the basement area, I went ahead and had photographed, uh, you know, with my digital camera, took three photos in a row and one of them, came up with these yellow and green and yellow streaks of light, which I've never seen before or after doing a paranormal investigation here. Unfortunately, uh, in 2004, the inn was purchased by Shabbat of the main line. And it's, of course, a Jewish synagogue now. So fortunately, the current owners don't uh, allow any paranormal investigations there because of their Jewish beliefs. But I hope eventually someday they reopen the inn because I think it would be a fantastic place for a lot of paranormal enthusiasts. So hopefully down the road, they'll entertain that idea. So we also circled the 2004 when I went to Westchester University, got my Bachelor of Science in Business Administration in 2008. And around that time, much like everybody, um, ghost hunters were starting to come out on TV and they were really pioneering um, all the uh, subject. And they were really showing, like, you know, doing the evidence review process, driving to and from the location, meeting with the clients, determining, um, debunking what they what they could explain and what could be rational but also, you know, capturing evidence and showing the reveal process at the end of every thing. So Jason and Grant, who I've met personally quite a few times, uh, have um, really influenced me a lot to start my own team. So 
much like everybody, the Ghost Hunters really was one of the first. And of course, um, Ghost Haunted with the Yvette Fielding and Carl in the UK, of course, were a huge influence for me too. And uh, I know Yvette has done a lot of stuff at the Tower of London and all that. So she's another. Oh, that's really... a fascinating place, I hear. Yes, absolutely. And so in Yvette and Carl, and then factor in 2007, my best friend Gwen, who went to school with Katrina, the Paranormal State came out, of course, with the students from Penn State with Heather Taddy and you know, yeah, speaking Ryan of Buell. Katrina Weidman, correct? Yes, yep. And Ryan Buell and all of them. So all right, they were yeah. also in. Uh, and then, of course, when Ghost Adventures came out with Zach Baggins and Aaron Goodwin, I mean, everyone knew, you know, who who they are. And, you know, all these shows started coming out on TV. So I think, you know, during this time period, I really started researching more and, you know, trying to understand, like, why of these paranormal occurrences were uh, occurring. So I started reading books by Hans Holzer. He was pretty much the godfather of American ghost hunting. Uh, he, uh, you know, as his father, Files, Alex, I've seen that. Yeah, that's a great show. And the really great Holzer Files is it kind of recaptures that feel of those original investigations, but in a modern sense. So much like everybody, I started thinking, about, okay, well, I want to do some fun projects to get started in the paranormal. So what I did is in 2014, I um, was watching this episode called The Haunting of Summerwind, uh, Summerwind Mansion, which was, uh, you know, this ruined mansion on the shores of West Bay Lake, Wisconsin. And there I saw a subject or uh, a uh, thing that said blueprints for sale. And the blueprints were for sale. I reached out to the seller and it turned out to be Raymond Von Bober Jr., who is the brother of one of the persons that had a, le a lot of alleged paranormal activities in the uh, haunted history of Summerwind. And after buying the blueprints, I found a newsfeed of Summerwind on YouTube. And on YouTube, of course, they... Uh, I reached out to the seller. It turned out to be Craig Nearing, my longtime business colleague from the Fox Valley Ghost Hunters up in the UP in Wisconsin in, in Michigan. And um, we created the Summer Wind Restoration Society in June of 2014 to rebuild, restore, and relaunch Summer Wind as a haunted bed and breakfast. It would be like the haunted, no one's ever rebuilt a haunted house before. So I started going knee deep into that project. And um, it was uh, fantastic. And I would love to go through the haunted history with you about Summer Wind. Well, I'll tell you, it sounds like things started kind of like, you know, with a little bit of a spark and just snowballed from there. And, uh, you know, just going going back to I, I think it's really funny when I was a kid, you say when I was a kid in 1984, I was already drinking beer and driving not at the same time at that point in my life. <laughs> and uh, but, you know, you're right. It, it was the, the shows that I remember uh, early on uh, prior to uh, Unsolved Mysteries, which was always very captivating. I used to watch uh, In Search of, which was narrated by Leonard Nimoy and hosted by Leonard nice. Nimoy. And that was that was a very cool show. You mentioned Art Bell. I used to listen to Art Bell coast to coast with my dad all the time on NPR. Oh. So, there, you know, there's a there's a lot of history. Like, you know, I think when uh, in the early aughts, when the when the ghost hunting shows started to pick up steam and props to the folks from the Atlantic Paranormal Society, the TAPS guys, Jason Grant um and and the original crew there uh as listeners of this show know I'm, I'm acquainted with them as i was part of that group before they were on tv back when we were just a local yokel group and uh, and they've done so well for themselves and i always give a shout out because i'm so proud of them they're all great folks and they work very diligently and very hard at what they do jason grant steve oh, they do an amazing job and uh they're very very dedicated people they were that dedicated when it was just local so it's it's absolutely their dedication is 100 percent bona fide. But, you know, it's there's you know, like I said, there's a, there's so much more now. And, and and I think that opens up a lot more conversations. I think in earlier times, like you said, the equipment, the, the tech has changed. People are researching and developing tech. People are going out and and talking to other people about this. And used to be you mentioned any of this and you were the weirdo in the room. Absolutely. Now it's quite hip. <laughs> exactly. And I think it's because with all these shows, like really, really helping pioneering and, you know, taking the paranormal mainstream, it's a lot easier now to have a conversation about a UFO like spotted in some place or a Bigfoot spotted in the wilderness or, you know, a ghost, you know, captured in this haunted house and, you know, off this old hill. So I think it's a lot more people are more open minded to it. And there's actually a lot of people actually believe in life after death. There's actually I think about two thirds of Americans actually believe in some form of existence after we pass on. So, you know, when you have two thirds of people believing in some kind of form of, you know, spirits, it definitely uh, seems to me that a lot of this is because people are open minded, but they're just afraid to talk about. It. But now it's OK to talk about it because times have changed. Very true. I mean, and there's and there's different tools. I mean, the tech has changed. But 
folks can start any kind of an investigation. If people suspect there's some sort of activity in their house or someplace they frequent where they work, with whatever, you know, it can really just start it with your camera phone. It can exactly. start with a small digital recorder. You don't have to. I think a lot of people mistake that you because they see the high tech stuff. And right. I had the pleasure uh, last year of speaking with Dan Sturgis from uh, Paranormal Caught on Camera. And he does oh. uh, investigations over in uh, in New York City and, and whatnot. And, and I started talking tech with him and he's very savvy and, he, and he's very, very knowledgeable. But he says he himself, he says, you know, if you're actually experiencing it on an organic level, if you're just uh, observing uh, an apparatus, you know, you should really need only just, you know, your, your eyes and your ears or in this, you know, cameras and, and things. He says, it's, you know, you can, you can, you can build from there and he doesn't disparage the use of other things. He says, but for him, really the main thing is the camera and the recording, you know, just being able to capture and save what you experienced organically yourself. And I think that's, that's a nice grassroots way to look at it because sometimes, I mean, some of this tech has gone insane. Those little, um, the, you know, the ghost boxes, then they've become geo ports. And, and for folks oh. who may not understand what I'm talking about, ghost boxes are radio frequency sweep radios. They're basically your old fashioned little radio shack transistor radio that's been rigged to do a sweep, not unlike when you're doing a seek in the car for, for a decent radio station. I don't think anybody does that anymore because everybody's got satellite now. But <laughs> back when you used to toy around and try to get the, the thing to see. But be, uh, via uh, changing the stations, it's able to um, filter in and it is used as a tool for spirits to speak through. And then they've added some cleanup to it. I've built um, with uh, a noise gate, a reverb, and, and some other uh, musician bits and pieces that I I I was able to put together a portal together uh and, and it's there's a lot you can do but I think going back to grassroots like what's the best piece of evidence you've ever captured and how did you capture it I want to say probably out of every investigation we've done so far there is probably we were at this place called Boobies Brewery with our friends Melissa and Jerry Keller Boobies of Boobies Brewery Experiment. Yep it's in Mount Joy Pennsylvania and we were actually in the uh ballroom area upstairs in the third floor ballroom and of course we were with our team members rick and melissa uh, who aren't here today but they're actively on our investigations every every week and melissa of course uh is a student of cindy case from the holzer files and of course rick is a, a former delaware mufon member who started his own extraterrestrial research center organization we were taking folks who may not pictures. realize uh, mufon is mutual ufo network correct yes yep yes. they have their own certification process and all that and during up in the ballroom area, we just started uh, using the thermal thermal camera. It's a standard FLIR uh, TG-165 we bought from Dave Giuliano, who's great. Such a nice guy. And um, with the TG-1, we started zapping around, and all of a sudden, we, we captured a thermal picture. You can see three figures back-to-back -back, um, with tank tops on. I've never seen anything like that before on a paranormal investigation. So this was like one of the most amazing pieces that we've ever captured. And Almost every time on every investigation, we've captured numerous EVPs, thermal images, SLS, and all that. So we always get, but I think it's the way that we approach from what Jason and Grant have advised me on um, over the years was just be yourself and be kind and treat the spirits with respect. Treat them like it's like their home, even though they're still no longer living. If you say please and thank you, you're going to get a lot of more positive results than instead of provoking like a Zach Bagley if you did it to him. To me. <laughs> well, now that there's such a such a plethora of shows, I mean, everybody gets their favorites. They get they get the folks they love to watch. They get the folks they love to hate, and they get the people that they just don't tune in. And, and there's so a little something I think for everyone. Now you were talking about the FLIR, and and again, for the let not everybody is is necessarily hip on the lingo. FLIR is an infrared attachment, and actually, uh, for folks that are interested. Um, you can actually go on Amazon and I think for about a couple of hundred dollars, get an attachment for a, a smartphone that's going yeah. to affect uh, real estate uh, building inspectors use this to uh, the, the type of technology is often used in construction to identify where cold air might be leaking in around windows because it measures the, the temperature and, and it has an infrared thing. But like so many things. The paranormal community has taken, uh, you know, the technology that was already in existence and put it into a different use. Exactly. And what's really cool about these thermal imaging cameras, also, they're also used for missing people out in the wilderness. They can use them for like field searches and all that. Like to pick up hot, it's cold, hot and cold signatures. All the mechanics use them when they're trying to diagnose and try to troubleshoot it on a car. 
So there's a lot of practical uses for thermal energy I see cameras. Those, I think a lot of us have seen a uh, footage on the news where somebody might where they have the FLIR uh, hooked up to the to the like the the, the police helicopter. Job. Right. right. And they're able to search an area to see if someone, the, the warm signature of, of a, a body, say, running through the woods or wherever, they'll be able to find, they're able to apprehend people who may be exactly. uh, escaping on foot from, from the air. Be able exactly. To, from a prison. It's a break exactly. It really is. And I think, um, especially so, I mean, thermal cameras are some of the best devices if you know how to properly really use them and you know how to and also try to shoot them in unoccupied rooms that's what we do a lot of times that's what we get so many positive results but if it's something cold that dave giuliano told me it's like it's, it's not a living person but if it's a heat signature like such as a cat you'll be able to see it <laughs> you know right yeah there's is there it's gets there's a there's a lot of like i said I, I think a lot of people think this tech is astronomical and when when a lot of it is really just adapted from everyday stuff or from stuff that had other uses one of my favorite tricks is i call it the cat toy rem pod is oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The REM yeah pod. those little those little cat toys that are little balls with lights in them I, and i've seen I, uh, folks yeah. one of the one of the other guests that we had on she has them at her studio and and is using them for positive response and i've seen them used in other investigations Whereas if somebody's going to get an actual REM pod, I mean, that's, you know, they're going to invest a little bit of money into that. But if you're looking to have some kind of a, a touch sensitive item, you can actually, if you were to, if folks were to Google um, paranormal cat toy, you're going to find these little balls and it's, I don't know, you get about five or six of them for about 12 bucks and you can put them in various places and turn them on and, and, in, you know, and use them as a, as a device. Exactly, because there's inexpensive devices out there. Instead of shelling out like you know sixty or one hundred and hundred dollars or two hundred dollars for a top tech run pod, you can just go get a light up cat ball for as little as um, you know four to uh, six to twelve dollars. And um, the people get it. I don't can't see us. I'm, I'm actually pulling out a REM pod and I'm making like Vanna White with the with my with my my fancy new REM pod. <laughs> I'm a jerk. Nice. One thing I do love about um, the REM pods too is they're great for motion. And a lot of them, when you have set up the antenna, sometimes they can pick up motion from all the way 8 to 10, 12 feet away. So yes. they have long range things. So, for example, if you're not in a room and you put a DVR camera or an NDR camera on that REM pod and something lights up, you probably have some kind of legit paranormal activity or just got to make sure that nothing, no one else is in the room. Like a cat doesn't run by, sets it off, or like a dog, you know. So, right. but it's good to have, um, you know, um, I light up cat balls and REM pods all set up because the more motion stuff that you have, the more better, the more better evidence you're going to get. True. And, and, and like I said, it's, it's you just got to think a little bit outside of the box and use something. Now, have you ever had a paranormal experience before you got deeply into this or did you get interested and then seek them out? I started getting interested in seeking them out. Um, after the summer wind thing, I sort of really started reaching out and, you know, wanting to do like more of these investigations. So I started just like everybody else would start doing public investigations and uh, started going to like Penhurst and all that and start putting myself out there, meeting a lot of like-minded people uh, and some of the overnight parent investigations. And for all your listeners that want to get their start, the best way to, you know, start a team or join is to start doing these public investigations, go out and meet people, network with them and learn Absolutely. how they do their investigations. And then you can apply what they teach you uh, to your own investigation. So it's great because you might be able to find, that's how I got to meet my original lead investigator for fan detectives, uh, Sasha, who uh, helped me found the company is, uh, you know, we started building the uh, banner under in, in August of 2020. And she's a Civil War reenactor, sound engineer. Uh, she cool. invented a pair of equipment. So having her, her, you know, I met her in one of the public investigations and that's how you get your start. And of course, um, working with Art Bell staff members really helped me get out there and network with all these guests that we booked. Uh, you know, that was a, a, a pleasure itself. So I am very lucky and fortunate to have had the opportunities that I've had. And it's all about just pushing yourself to do better. And since August of 2020, we've been mentioned as one of the best up and coming teams in the field, just working uh, consistently, learning from every investigation, making mistakes and learning how we can be better. And the more that you practice and do it, the easier it gets. And I think that we've really gotten um, to a point that we're starting to build up quite a following just by you know, staying humble, doing good work, networking with people, helping our clients, and also doing our best to uh, help others. And that's what we try to do. We try to always learn from every investigation. And that's what you can do is the more that you can learn and more apply different various forms of using the scientific method, you're going to be golden. Yeah. 
the scientific method is definitely the way to go. One of the things that you had mentioned is uh, Penhurst Asylum. For, for folks who are outside of the area, Penhurst Asylum is a, an asylum that is also, I believe, a National Historic Landmark in uh, Silver City, Pennsylvania. I always want to call it Silver Spring Spring. City. Spring City. Yeah, oh, exactly. gosh. Oh, they're they're gonna they're gonna love that Spring City, PA, in Spring City, yeah. Pennsylvania, which is uh, going towards Central PA outside of the Philly area. Um, it is it is an impressive structure. It is a big stone uh, campus full of full of very cool, creepy buildings. They do a lot around Halloween, but also this uh, this episode's gonna air on uh, April fourteenth. And coming up this May, and that's basically how Josh and I became networked, is there's going to be a Paranormal Expo and Oddities Market, and Darker Art Studio is going to be there. The Paranormal Detectives are going to be there. And uh, that's going to be at the Penhurst Asylum from uh, May 19th to the 21st. The vendors are going to be on the Saturday and Sunday, the 20th and 21st. But uh, uh, the old buddies uh, from Ghost Hunters are going to be there. Uh, Christina, I know, is I believe, is she going to be there? No, no, she's not. Yep, I she, she's going to be Christina there. Christina Wyman is oh. going to be there. Folks can go on uh, the Penhurst Asylum website and look at Penhurst Paracon, and they can see a list of guests. So don't believe me because I'm senile. But um, there's going to be, you know, some wonderful vendors, some amazing vendors. We're going to have lots of groups that are represented uh, from different areas of the country and lots of networking opportunities, investigative opportunities, because the place is very, very haunted. So it is something you definitely want to check out. Now, we've talked, we've mentioned Art Bell a, a couple of times. As I said, I know him even from my childhood as listening to him on NPR for Coast to Coast and everything. And then there's his Dark Matter site and all of that stuff. Kind of, if you would, let us know how you got involved with the Art Bell uh, empire and, and where your involvement stands now. How did I get involved with Art Bell? Well, it started way, way back, even when he was toying around the idea of coming up with a new show. In 2013, he was trying to make his final return. Uh, he actually did a six-week run on Sirius XM radio. Um, unfortunately, during that time, he... Sirius XM one of one of his subscribers to pony up two hundred dollars a year to um you know be able to keep his show on the network and Art's like no way we're not doing uh, that at all so he went ahead and um, it employed his a wonderful architect by the name of Keith Rowland uh, Keith of course is his longtime webmaster and you know programmer he you know uh, when it comes to putting up you know running the streams and putting up pictures on you know, the UFO on the website Keith uh, built this dark matter digital network architecture in 2013 and so what he started doing was he started uh setting up streams for it. and of course it was set up with an xds feed where just a flip of a switch radio stations from all over the world could stream art bell's radio show so uh that was pretty amazing with that having that built-in xds feed and he, with a satellite art could reach the same amount of stations that coast to coast am his previous show with george nori actually uh you know went ahead and did so what was amazing about this was after he set up the streaming network uh he hired my mentor who was one of his producers dr j uh as was the original producer of the dark matter digital network and uh one day i started calling into his show and uh you know i said hey uh would you be uh, interested in bringing my friends craig nearing kevin malik and jennifer skelsey from the summer wind restoration society on dr j radio live you know which was the uh primary lead-up show to art bill's midnight in the desert officially endorsed by art himself and you know, Wonderful. Dr. J said, sure, I'll bring, bring him on your show. So I started working with Doc uh, on his show, and he, of course, works with the world's largest UFO channel, Third Phase of the Moon, with more than 800,000 subscribers um, on YouTube. And so uh, basically, we started talking, and all of a sudden, I started working with him, started just doing audio, just volunteering on the side and editing some of Dr. J's audio files, video editing some of his, you know, radio shows. And eventually it led to me getting, um, you know, kind of like a producing, just booking his guests and all that and helping out. Uh, you know, if he couldn't get certain people who just say, hey, I need this person. And I would reach out and, you know, book uh, his guests. So, of course, I started working um, with him and also another former producer and this who actually was his Art Bell's protege. And she's currently unavailable this time. But she was absolutely amazing. Um, you're very talented as well. And, and of course, she, uh, you know, um, fortunately left in March of 2021. But I worked with both his producers and I booked all their guests and helped them um, behind the scenes, you know, comes to like, you know, 
having doing a sound check, writing the questions, um, you know, and then making sure that I have all the guests, you know, information. So the uh, and then of course making sure that all the audio was good and all the, their video was good. So having very important audio footage was producing art show. Um, I learned just exactly the way they they learned under art. So uh, it was a very successful run. And unfortunately, art only lasted uh, until December of 2015 before he um, unfortunately gave, you know, gun, gunshots were, you know, shot right outside of his house. And unfortunately, he retreated. Um, so basically, he didn't know what was going on. So he retired in December of 15 and gave the uh, sh the network and the hosting the show of over to my old boss. And then she took over and hosted it for two years. But unfortunately, she lost her mind during that time after he passed away. Fortunately, tomorrow will be five years since his passing. Right. So, you know, we all miss very much. And then, you know, um, after his passing, you know, she unfortunately uh, really went downhill for her. So it's just unfortunate, but she has a lot of talent. But hopefully someday she'll get back on the air. But what's really great was in August, May of 2021, a longtime friend of mine who was a colleague named Leo Ashcraft, who worked for Art Bell in 2015, on Midnight in the Desert, he had this newscast called Dark Matter News. So um, he said, hey, would you be interested in acquiring the rights to Dark Matter News? I no longer want it. Um, this was a newscast that I did for art, you know, just to talking about right. different things uh, during the bottom of every hour. So I went ahead and said, yes, I'll buy it. So we uh, agreed to an undisclosed price. So we bought the Dark Matter News website, darkmatternews.com, the rights to the audio files, which he had did in 2015. We bought the logos, the name. And then what we did, instead of just like letting the brand die, I decided, you know what, why don't we just go ahead and revive it under Phantom Detectives LLC's banner. So we went ahead and I had the old website torn down and I had it reprogrammed and kind of completely um, rebuilt from the ground up, um, you know, as a paranormal news hub. So we keep it as a live, as a tribute to Art's memory and everything that he did um, as a radio show host. So, um, you know, basically the... Uh, News service, you know, we keep it. Uh, the great thing about it, I love is I want to share this with the paranormal community. Everyone, that anyone that loves Art Bell and that loves this show, I want to be able to, you know, keep this going as long as I can. And, you know, the great thing is about it is since we rebranded it, it's, the traffic has started going up more and more. The dark um, matter you know, lives. The website. So, yes, absolutely. Yes. Dark and, matter um, lives. There was another. That's what's awesome. And the network itself is owned by a separate guy. So Keith, of course, you know, that was the news portion. The, the Dark Matter Digital Network was owned by Keith, of course, uh, Keith Rowland, who was Art's longtime webmaster. Well, unfortunately, he sold it in 2020 to a guy in Texas named David Rabini, who bought it. And then, um, um, unfortunately, he was supposed to, there was a big court case going on between the uh, network and the archives of Bell's final, final shows. Um, so this guy, Rubini, had purchased you know, the network, but unfortunately, he took out a $50,000 loan from this guy, Mark, Mike Marshallak. He lives in Hoboken up in northern New Jersey. So he actually uh, bought the network. And then, of course, um, this, this guy, Dave Rubini, was supposed to pay back the loan. But unfortunately, um, there was a court case a couple of years ago. I don't know if that ever got resolved. But I, um, you know, hopefully someday I would love to eventually buy the actual network itself and relaunch it um that would be absolutely awesome and give everyone like a place where they can you know um on the network where they can give everyone a home so we can continue to run the company as art bell would so right hopefully someday that could come to fruition but if not i got fan of detectives and i'm quite, quite happy with building this company from, from the ground and, and up for folks to know phantom detectives you, like you said you're based out of uh just west of philly um yeah. and i assume that you do investigations at least in the local area to through the, the Lehigh Valley and, and in the central eastern seaboard areas down to Delaware Water Gap, whatever um, the whole everybody who knows me knows I'm not originally from this area. I'm kind of winging this geography thing. But you do the region for sure. Yes. And of course, special investigations could be wherever, um, you know, look, at look. So from folks, if folks have a haunting or if they suspect that they have activity in there. Well, let's say in and around your catchment area. And even if they're not, they can always contact you and you might recommend someone in their area. But, um, you know, if someone were to contact you and say, you know, I got stuff flying off my shelves or, you know, the dog's acting weird, whatever it is that they've got going on, do they have to pay money for you to come out and investigate? We never charge investigations. Like I really believe in as much as possible to like try to 
we try to discourage that as much as possible. But there will be times that we have to drive somewhere and we have to pay for, you know, Mark Keys from the Pennsylvania Paranormal uh, Association always mentioned about like, you know, gas and hotel costs. If, they, if we have to drive, like, say, example, three states and silver to do an investigation, we would probably refer a team out in that area to cover that. But if we, if we have to do it, we can at least, you know, have some gas and hotel costs, at least, you know, which is understandable, you know, depending on how far we have to travel. But most of the time we just do it. For but you're party. in it for the evidence. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> so what we um, we actually so what we do is we actually set up a really great way for um, clients to reach out to us. Of course, we're on every one, like four or five paranormal directories now, you know, um, which really helps us get the word out there. But also my webmasters are really brilliant. So they came up with a way to actually for clients to reach us directly without having to email us and wait for us to respond. We act, they actually went ahead and built us an entire Discord server. Um, I thought this was something different because I see a lot more people using Discord. So in spring of 2020, I had our webmasters create a um, disc Phantom Detectives LLC Discord server, much like instead of having a contact form, they're thinking, hey, why don't we try this Discord server so people can hop on right there and chat with us live and you oh, know, they cool. want to reach us. On, That's awesome. Always on the Discord server. And of course, we have our email um, at the bottom. And of course, I have my cell phone number down there so people can reach me directly. And say, for example, there's a case where it's pretty extreme with a lot of poltergeist things going on. What we'll do then is I get the email, I'll take it, and then I'll give it to our um, team members, Melissa and Rick, who aren't here today. But Melissa is like our case manager, or she she's kind of like our Donna LaCroix. Remember how Donna was for TAPS? Yes. And um, what she does is she takes all the cases that come in, and then what she'll do is she'll reach out and say, hey, uh, you know, we got your information, and what we'll do is we'll talk it over. And what we'll do is we always talk and make decisions as a team. So we have a group text set up with our cell phones. And then what we'll do is, okay, say, hey, we've got X, Y, and Z. Client A is actually having this reported apparent activity. Should we do an audio interview with her? So much like on the shows where you'll see like, you know, them interview the client in person, we actually do it over the phone. So it's kind of similar, but we actually, like where Rick Warner comes in, he's pretty um, amazing because Rick actually has training from MUFON where he can, you know, from field searching and, you know, all that. And mm -hmm. he's actually created like, a list of pre-generated questions so he'll actually like you know, try to draw out the client's story as best as he can so by doing that like one based on the audio interview that mr warner does with um, the client then if the uh, case is warranted taking up then we'll set a date we'll have melissa email back and say and, hey, yeah it proceeds on from there sure now do you only do ghost investigations what what types of things does does phantom detectives investigate uh, just ghosts or anything else Oh, we um, mainly the, the group itself is fan detectives is pretty much, you know, focusing on ghosts. But like I said, we have uh, we have all of it covered. I mean, we got two psychic mediums. We got Melissa Ferrazano, who's not here today. And she's pretty. She's a clairvoyant, clairaudient, clairsendient. She's studied under, of course, um, Cindy Kayser from the Holzer Files. So she's really absolutely fantastic. And of course, we got Rick Warner, who runs his own standalone UFO organization. And Rick... Um, of course, uh, was part of Rufon. Of course, he created Extraterrestrial Research Center, um, ERC, the number two, explore.com. So ERC to explore.com. He has his own standalone organization where he re researches UFOs. So if you have any listeners that need UFO research, Rick is the guy to do it because he's actually also the U.S. ambassador to the Italian UFO Federation. So that's pretty much a lot. This guy is a pretty much a fantastic coming from the MUFON background. So we got UFOs, we got ghosts covered, and we got two world-renowned mediums. Not only do we have Melissa on our team, but we got the psychic lawyer, psychic explorer, Mark Anthony, who is, you know, um, evidence of eternity, um, never letting go. And of course, his newest book, The Afterlife Frequency. So we have the psychic lawyer on our team. Of course, he has to work with us remotely now, but we've got um, mediumship covered. And of course, eventually starting to dive into Bigfoot. So we've been in touch with Eric Altman about doing training um, up in, you know, in the future, up in the upper part of Pennsylvania to start doing some Bigfoot um, training. So I would love to start covering that as well. And really I lived out in the Pacific Northwest for a little while. And nice. um, one of the things I can tell you is uh, I, I, I've, I've tended bar off and on, especially in my youth when A, I could stand up that long and uh, B, when I needed some extra cash. And one of the things that I always said was that you always see the same people at every bar. The faces change, but you get the same the same group is always at every bar. And you know, everywhere I've been, every bar has its standard story. 
And like if you like if you hang out at a at a little little dive bar in New Jersey and people are talking, eventually you can hear somebody talk about running into either or both Bruce Springsteen or John Bon Jovi. You know, I was sitting on the beach in Ashbury and then Bruce Springsteen came up and somebody was taking wedding photos and John Bon Jovi was in the elevator with me. So everybody's got a story. And you go out and you start going into, you'll hear some weird, weird stuff about skunk apes down in Florida. You'll hear about the Lou Guru out in Louisiana and and whatnot. Of course, where I'm from in, in uh, southeastern New England, it's the Hockamock Swamp and all that. So when you go out to the Pacific Northwest, everybody has a Bigfoot story. Bigfoot is huge. No pun intended there. That's pretty yeah. awesome. And I always think back to 1967. What really started it all was I, I actually met Robert Gimlin before. He actually took the Bigfoot footage in the original um, Bigfoot you know, footage. Yeah. yeah. And basically, and you can see like it's very much ape like the way it's walking. And of course, they said it was debunked. And, you know, the Patterson Gimlin film has been like under a lot of magnified, under enhanced so many times over the years. So I still believe Robert Gimlin and his word. And I, I think that that footage is 100% legit. I mean, from what I've talked to him before, he uh, right. stands by the story that what he captured in 1967 is 100% authentic. And he was like 50 feet away from, so I, you know, that makes a lot of sense. You know, that footage has, has been, uh, hasn't been changed over the years. And, you know, he's still alive today, which is pretty amazing. He's it's very cool. Really nice, but he's still kicking. <laughs> and watch your trail cams, kids. You never know what's out there. Um, you know, so you've done quite a few investigations now over the years. Was there any moment? Two, 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 it's a two-part question. The first part is, have you learned something through your investigations that you didn't know before you started? Have you been either convinced or proven something to yourself that wasn't that until you saw you, whatever evidence you got, you weren't a believer? So did anything make a believer out of you of a, a, a particular thing? And the other thing was, at any point, scariest moment. Do you ever have one of those? Go. Yes. I'm going to say there's been so many investigations that I've done over the years since 2018, since I really started getting out there. The first one I'm going to say was this guy's apartment and down in Philadelphia. It was one of the scariest moments of my life because we were in this apartment and there was a lot of things going on. From this guy actually claimed that his bed sheets were being pulled off, you know, like you know, on a security camera. You can see like the heads of alien spirits, like in the, uh, corner of his room uh not to mention he also had strange markings on his leg which kind of you know showed like possibly do a boat abduction um also he actually reported you know he seeing hearing footsteps so what was interesting the day we did this investigation this was um filmed on dark hour paranormal um with michael roser and what was amazing was during this investigation we actually um, started going into that apartment in philadelphia and we started like feeling like literally like the wind like like getting gut punched the minute we walked into that place into the minute we walked out of that place we actually uh, started we felt like pretty much literally like there was like pressure on our chest every second and then and when we went into the uh apartment the bedroom of the apartment that's where we started picking up on this young 19 year old kid who committed suicide there um you know the spirit of this doing the doing the rem the dowsing rods which are rick is really good you know crossing yes for no and and we have, of course, the lighted dowsing rods from North Canton Paranormal Detective, which are seen in the dark, which are really great. Um, and then, of course, we scanned the ghost box and started picking up on this older woman and this younger woman. And the older woman, of course, they were called the potty mouth spirits, where we were started getting cussed out on the ghost box. Never seen oh that my. before. And then what was interesting was we also picked up an EVP where Melissa asked a question, um, is this an older woman here? Is this her home? And we got this EVP that said, right here. And that was absolutely terrifying. And then right. um, and th then we also did in September, rare, a month after that, we went to the Sanderson Museum. And the Sanderson Museum is a pretty amazing place because this is a place that's in Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania. It's like pretty much right outside of Philadelphia. And it, this was a place where um, a lot of, it's actually it was Christian Sanderson was a well-known violin maker. He hosted, you know, different dignitaries in the area. He was a radio show host. Um, he hosted square dances, just a musician also. And up, and we were actually there for world's largest ghost hunt, which is one of the national wow, ghost hunts. Very cool. Before. And when the day that we were there doing the world's largest ghost hunt, we were of course streaming for the hour that we were there. Uh, Melissa, Rick, and myself went up into the uh, actual different parts of the house. And of course, when Melissa, Rick went downstairs, they said the equipment bags, all of our equipment bags, were piled up on on top of each other. It's literally single file like this. And the funny thing is, nobody was in that room when that happened. So for those equipment bags to pile up 
the way they did like this, like, you know, a single file. And when, when Sasha and I, our, our previous team lead investigator, were upstairs in the violin room, which was the active room of the museum, that was completely terrifying. I've never seen that happen before. That's and an oh, hell no it, moment. Oh, hell no. <laughs> oh, and then, hell of course, no. We, we also run. played back. And, Please tell me you didn't run. You didn't run. <laughs> we didn't run. We stayed firm. We stayed, you stayed firm. Good for you. Because you ever look at and this, and I'm not picking on any one particular show. You ever look at one of these shows and they've they've gone through great lengths to set up equipment to travel to a location. That they, something happens and they run. Exactly. Why did you yes, go? You wanted some. What, that's the whole point. You're there. You're there. You're there to document, try to get evidence uh, for the clients. And what was even terrifying is um, we actually uh, you know went back and you know said hey. Or did you, try, Melissa asked a question, like, did you we'll put, pile uh, our equipment bags, you know, uh, to, to block us from leaving? And we got a clear, intelligent response that said, get out. Like, I never heard that before on the audio reporter, you know, oh, actually right. say that. And that to me was like completely terrifying. So that to me showed like whatever spirits were there that were definitely haunting there, did not want us there. But it was interesting was not only that, but we also started hearing like, you know, we started hearing like, you know, different footsteps in different parts of the house so we couldn't figure out where they were coming from and nobody was outside we were the only ones on the property and um to make a believer out of people one of the most terrifying pieces of evidence that we captured this was absolutely i've never seen this happen before this was our second ever investigation at the mill of anselma in chester springs pennsylvania this is the oldest operating mill uh in the united states it dates back to 1747 and the night that we were there um doing this was when uh before melissa and rick joined the team uh, we were there for a second investigation. This door completely bolted shut, latched up, and flew open by itself with no reasonable explanation. And that was one of the most wow. amazing evidence that we've ever captured on investigation. And you can find that video on our YouTube channel, Phantom Detectives LLC. So folks can go to YouTube to Phantom Detectives LLC, and they can also find all the buttons and gigas and connections at phantomdetectives.org, correct? Yes, absolutely. And... We got... Oh, go ahead. We got five websites uh, on our team, basically. We, not only do we have phantomdetectives.org, but darkmatternews.com, erc2explore.com, Melissa's a psychic medium, autumn.com, and of course, Mark Anthony, the psychic lawyers is afterlifefrequency.com. So there's a lot going on there. One last question before we wrap up. Bucket list investigation. What's the place you want to investigate that you haven't been yet? Can be anywhere. Think big. Think big, Josh. Where do you want I'm to go? You could go anywhere, and somebody said, "We'll put you there for an investigation." Where do you want to? Where do you want to go? Oh, I would have to say the Winchester House. It, to me, oh yeah, in California, sure, absolutely out in San Jose. And this whole thing about Sarah Winchester and the Winchester repeating rifle, and how they supposedly in order to appease the spirits that were killed by the Winchester reading rifle, she built this house on you know things on top of that. So that would be one of my dreams someday to get out there because factor in. All that energy of all these spirits are probably still trapped inside of that place. And, you know, to me, like from all of the reports that I've seen over the years, people seeing things, hearing things there, sure. that would be like a mecca of super, supernatural activity. And you of course, think. Myrtle's and mind. So cool. That house looks crazy cool. I'd just love to see the house. I'd love to take a tour of it just like a regular tourist, never mind everything else. Well, that is wonderful. A reminder to folks that uh, both Josh and myself are going to be in attendance at the Penhurst Asylum Paracon and Oddities Expo, and that is at the Penhurst Asylum. And you can go on their website. If you look up Penhurst Asylum Paracon, you'll see all the information that's going to be on May 19th through 21. Again, us vendors are going to be out there in the showroom on the 20th and the 21st. Anything else coming up you want to tell the folks about, Josh? Oh, absolutely. So we got some exciting news. Uh, we're actually going to be releasing a documentary. We've been on a lot of local news stations lately, really getting a lot of exposure with our team and our company. We also have been, uh, over the last six months, we've been featured down in Lower Delaware. We made the Cape Gazette down there. We actually investigated a light ship and actually picked up a, a, a Class A EVP that said, hello, help me. And we've been featured on the local news down there in WRDE Coast AM, as well as Delmarva Life. So there's going to be a two-part documentary coming out uh, on uh, TV Delmarva, which is like a local news station down there. Um, well, folks can pick it up on the internet, too, and see it as well if they're from somewhere yeah. else. Yeah, and it's really cool at this place. is We actually did a Governor of Delaware's house, the former Governor of Delaware called the Governor Ross Mansion down in Seaford. And um, this is actually going to be going on TV Delmarva, I think, in the next couple of weeks. So as soon as the news reporter who we worked with, Ed's 
to edit it up and package it, and we'll release that um, footage from that investigation. And what's amazing about the governor of Ross Mansion is we don't we just did part one of the investigation. We're going to go back for part two, which includes there's a lot of exterior. There's like a honeymoon suite there. There's a cottage there. So the uh, reporter is going to be coming back and releasing part two of that documentary. We'll be going back there in late May. Uh, for that investigation. So we're going to wrap up uh, the Governor Wells Mansion in Seaford and then hopefully, um, you know, release that documentary for you. I think your viewers are going to absolutely love it. I, I think that they will indeed. I want to thank you so much. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a blurb after I finish up that'll tell everybody exactly how they can get in touch. But of course, you're going to be making all of these announcements on your social media pages and all of that good stuff. And they can get right into that portal by going to phantomdetectives.org and branching out from there to make sure that they can keep up with all of your information. It's been a pleasure. I'm looking forward to seeing you next month at the Paracon. And is there anything else that you want to tell us? I just want to say for all those, like continue to go out there, work hard and all those people that just go out there and find your own paranormal experiences. Um, and also, you know, go out there and just try to, you know, Meet, meet, meet like-minded people at Paracon. Get out there and learn, like, you know, from some of the best. And you can network and find all these great vendors who are going to be there. And not to mention, you can also meet some of the biggest names in the paranormal, kindred spirits, uh, ghost hunters, and also um, destination fear. So come out come out and see all of us, and we will love to network with all of you guys, because it's you guys who make it possible. Without you guys, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. And that is absolutely true. And without you guys, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Josh, thank you so much. And to all those folks listening, as I always say, stay kooky out there. Thank you for listening to Macabre World. You can find us on the web at www.darkerartstudio.com. Join one of Pennsylvania's established paranormal investigation teams on their YouTube channel, Phantom Detectives LLC, and follow them on social media. Phantom Detectives LLC is a professional paranormal investigation team from Oxford, Pennsylvania. They conduct investigations from historical societies to homes, businesses, asylums, and more. The team provides free home investigations to more robust investigations with the public. Each member is well-trained on history, educated on all eight areas of the paranormal, and will bring an excellent attention to detail to every investigation. PDLLC will be conducting free information forums at libraries all over Pennsylvania. During these sessions, they will go over evidence from past investigations, how they conduct investigations, and answer questions from the public. The team will be making numerous trips across the United States to conduct investigations in America's most haunted locations. Dream locations include Waverly Hills Sanitarium, the Winchester House in San Jose, Myrtle's Plantation, and more. Dr. Hans Holzer is one of their biggest inspirations. PDLLC is a nonprofit organization offering unique services to the public. Their goal is to demystify the supernatural and reduce fear of the unexplained. Every evidence review will be kept confidential and will not be released without the client's consent. A report will be generated for every client after each evidence review is completed. To reach Phantom Detectives LLC on their websites, please go to www.phantomdetectives.org, psychicmediumautumn.com, afterlifefrequency.com, and irk2explore.com. That's E-R-C, the numeral two, explore.com. To reach them from the Rockies East, please call 484-790-9941. That's 484-790-9941. To reach them from the Rockies West, please call 717-219-4585. That's 717-219-4585. To reach their case manager on their wildcard line, please dial 601-490-0929. That's 601-490-0929. For their lead investigator, please email ercrfw at gmail.com. That's ERCRFW at gmail.com. Want to take a ride? From the high plains of the great northeast, close to where the country was born, here is Phantom Detectives, LLC.
Details shared by our clients will be handled with the utmost care. In addition, they will create a file cabinet of every case investigated. The group will be fully insured for the safety of Phantom Detectives LLC's clients and members. If you are interested in having your home or business investigated, feel free to fill out the contact form and the team will get back to you. Phantom Detectives LLC welcomes our followers on Instagram, Flickr, Tumblr, YouTube, Twitter, and on MeWe. They will be going to some amazing haunted locations in 2022 to launch the group. These include Penhurst, the Betsy Ross House in Philadelphia, Gettysburg, Fort Mifflin, the Anselma Mill in Chester Springs, Pennsylvania, Sanderson Museum in Chadsford, the Fulton Opera House in Lancaster, and many more. The clients, fans, and followers with whom they build relations will be